Now, don't get me wrong. If if you need them, you need them. I'm not telling anybody not to take antibiotics. But I am saying this, that I would much rather take my chances with something that is natural, that is not going to hurt me and not going to harm me before I resort to taking antibiotics. Uh, in the year 2000, um, the CDC reported that there were 70,000 people in America that died because of infections that uh, antibiotics did not take care of. Okay, that's 70,000 people that died from infections using routine antibiotics. Now, I think uh, colloidal silver is probably a little safer than those antibiotics that people are dying from. So uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies, they don't want us to realize that. Uh, colloidal silver was, it has a long history. It, the actual electrical colloidal silver uh, was invented back in 1924. Therefore, it is, that was the idea of actually putting an electric current through water and creating a colloid, which is sloughing off the silver ions into a suspension. And that's what a, a colloid is, is it's uh, putting the particles into suspension. So it was created in 1924. The FDA wasn't even around yet back then, and so this is grandfathered in. The uh, pharmaceutical companies would love to ban it. They keep trying to ban it because they make a lot of money on antibiotics, but they can't do it because this is grandfathered in. And it goes way back even before that. Uh, back in Persia, 4,000 years ago, they were using silver as an antibiotic. Um, uh, the pioneers used silver, they'd throw a silver dollar in a milk jug and that would keep the milk from going sour on them. So it's, it's been well documented. The medical uh, field today use, uses silver. They use silver nitrate drops in infants when they're born to uh, prevent uh, Neisseria gonorrhea from uh, cr causing blindness. Um, if somebody has uh, a severe burn, a burn victim patient, they will take the, all the bandages and dressings and soak them into a silver solution and put that on them to protect them in, from infection on their burns. So it, even the medical community admits silver works. I went in more recently, um, uh, Mark, my other half, now he's, he's, a, he's a chemist, and he really doesn't have experience with colloidal silver, and he doesn't want to even try it. So, and, and that's fine with him, you know, I mean, that's fine. But here, about a month ago, first he came down with stomach flu, and I started taking my colloidal silver. My grandson was there, and he had stomach flu. I'm still taking my colloidal silver. And then a week later, uh, Mark comes down with uh, uh, influenza A, H1N1, which is the swine flu, and I'm still, I'm taking my colloidal silver, and he's in the hospital, and I never got sick. Now, what's the difference? I did, I took the colloidal silver, and, and that provided some protection that he did not have. Um, I started looking up in uh, the EPA, and the EPA actually, as far as a disinfectant for H1N1, lists silver as a disinfectant. So even the government has to admit that silver works and it's effective. It is effective on 645 different organisms, uh, not only bacteria, it's also effective on uh, viruses. Uh, like I said, the H1N1, it's effective on fungal infections. A lot of people use it to treat nail funguses and it's effective on parasites. So. Uh, colloidal silver can be used as a broad spectrum uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, on any one celled organism. And because it only attacks one celled organisms, like bacteria and viruses, parasites and viruses, uh, because it only attacks one celled organisms, we're multi celled. So we don't get attacked. So we can take it safely without harm. So that makes a, a tremendous advantage over uh, chemical 
uh, antimicrobials. Uh, very simple to uh, make, in, make colloidal silver. I'm going to pass this out if you guys can. Uh, okay. Now, I might be a little short. If there's any married couples here, if you could just take one copy between the two of you, I'd appreciate it. I'm going to be cutting it a little tight. But one of the things that you need to make your colloidal silver is a generator. Uh, and you need silver wires. Uh, the silver wires need to be 99.999% pure. That's very important. One of the things with silver is you, there's always a risk of toxicity if it combines with unwanted compounds. So we don't want to form something like a, a silver nitrate that could be toxic to us to ingest. Uh, we don't want to form a silver chloride. Uh, if you, if you use tap water when you're ma making it, uh, what you're forming is silver chloride. It'll form a real cloudy uh, colloidal silver, and, and that's inappropriate for uh, ingesting. In that case, I would only use it as an external uh, uh, uses. But, uh, so you, you need uh, the silver wire. I've got, I'll show you what I've got here. Now, I use, people do, do the silver in different ways, but it's, it has to be 99.99% pure. I have a 14 gauge silver wire that I use. I have used these wires, same ones, okay, since 1994. And I'll probably use the same set of wires for another 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, it's not like it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Once you have your silver, you can use it over and over and over again. You just need to keep it clean and wipe any oxidation off in the process. I obtained these through a jewelry wholesale distributor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a source that I, I track down if you all want to go together and, and get it. Uh, it's about eleven and a half dollars uh, for a set of silver wires, which is an extremely good price. Uh, and, and then it would just be some shipping on top. So probably if everybody pitches in like thirteen dollars to cover the shipping, yes. Uh, no, are, are silver dollars pure enough to use to hammer into a wire? Uh, I don't know about a silver dollar. Now the. Yeah. 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 One ounce silver rounds that are ninety nine point nine nine, but that's not. Yeah. If you that this is an example. Uh, um, I've heard some stuff. That yeah. Doc, against that. Doc has yeah. been using his here, and he, he's uh, now now that has a broader surface area, so it it may. Uh, I'm not sure if that it would probably cause a faster reaction. Right. I let it go too long. The mm -hmm. reason it's so dark <laughs> right. um, is I hooked it up and I forgot about it and left it running. But I use a higher voltage. I use a different method than she does. I've got instructions on the method that I use. I got okay. it from a book. Uh, so mine is just a different method, but I let it run too long and it got like that. But I, right. I, I can still use that. There's nothing wrong with using that. But Doc, you're saying that those are silver dollars? No, those are, no, no, these those are, are, nine, these nine, are nine, the, nine, Troy, the okay. Troy ounces. Yeah. yeah, the silver bars, gotcha. yeah. and those you, you can use. Now, uh, some people I've seen uh, suggest using silver foil, the silver strips. But uh, that, from, from my research, that is not pure silver. What those silver strips are is sterling silver, and you do not want to use the sterling silver. It's got to be 99.999% pure. Uh, I will, if anybody's interested, I'll pass this list around if you want to sign up, uh, and then we can order some in. Uh, but, uh, so that's the first thing you need. The, the second key component is going to be your water. Okay, and now this just happens to be Deerberg's drinking water with reverse osmosis. I've used about every kind of water out there. It doesn't really matter the brand, but it needs, I find reverse osmosis works the best. 
uh, never, ever, ever ingest colloidal silver made with tap water because it combines with the chlorine and you're going to end up with silver chloride. And it, one way you can tell if that's happening is your colloidal silver is going to be very cloudy, kind of a milky white color. And you're going to see a very rapid, fast reaction when you, when you uh, uh, set up your generator. I use um, um, reverse osmosis water, too. In, in mm -hmm. that. Believe it or not, that's reverse osmosis water. Usually <laughs> I use distilled water, but distilled or reverse osmosis uh -huh. is fine. Right. Uh, the distilled, the distilled, wa well, distilled water is fine. I mean, that's distilled water works great. Deionized water can sometimes be a problem. You think it would be better because you, you don't have any compounds in there that the silver can react with. But the problem is, is also you can't form, there aren't enough electrolytes in the water to, to begin an electrical reaction. And so it's very difficult to try to make it with deionized water. Yes? Um, by, by the definition, it's still water that have the ions in it to conduct electricity, right? Um, well, that's no, you're, right. that would be deionized water. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be uh, the deionized water. I, I use distilled, distilled water all the time, and it works. Distilled it works water, uh, the water goes through a series of filtration, and that's that's how uh, how they they make the distilled water. Uh, reverse osmosis, the water goes through various membranes. It's a little bit different, but uh, uh, either distilled or reverse osmosis will work very well. Yes. When I first started making colloidal silver, that was the recommended procedure, was to make a salt, uh, actually it was a sea salt water solution, and then you would use it to start your colloidal silver, and then every batch after that, you would take a little bit of that colloidal silver and use it as a seed for your next batch. But again, that's not a good way because you can end up with toxic compounds. Okay, but so, so there we have that. Another thing that we need when we're making colloidal silver is once you start it, as you can, as you can see from uh, uh, these electrodes here, you're, go you're going to end up with corrosion on your silver. Okay, and that's where these pads come in handy because you want to wipe that corrosion off. When you see the black, on your colloidal silver like this, that means uh, oxidation. And so if your silver is oxidized, you're not going to have a therapeutic value from it. So when you make your colloidal silver, if you see black, it's probably not good. I would pitch it if it turns black on me. Um, and and Several times during the process that I used to make it, I will literally clean, take it out and clean these off and, and remove any oxidation. Uh, and that just, it helps me avoid having to filter the solution afterwards. Did yours ever pit? Did the silver ever pit? Uh, I haven't had a problem with it pitting. Uh, like I said, I've, I've used these same wires for many, many years. Um, there are several ways that you can make a generator. And now we're getting to the, this is the scary part, especially for us women, is uh, <laughs> trying to make anything with uh, any kind of electrical wires. <laughs> what I have here, and there's different types of generators. You can choose to buy a generator, or you can choose to make a generator. What I found is there's all kinds of hype and fads out there. People will tell you all this stuff about particle size and, and parts per million, and they make you think that you have to spend all this money, $200, on a generator in order to have something that's going to be therapeutic for you. Don't fall for it. Don't buy it. There's a bunch of snake oil out there. I mean, even if uh, I would agree that uh, having a smaller uh, particle size is better. 
for, for spending $200 on a generator, no. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, recommend going that route. All you need is the ideal amount of electricity to run through your, uh, through your uh, deionized water is 30 volts. So if we, if we string together three 9-volt batteries, you're going to get 27 volts. That's pretty close. And so all you need is uh, you just take uh, three of these connectors, uh, put them onto your batteries here like this, and then you put alligator clips on the ends. Okay, and so and what I've done is I put a little a little sh heat shrink wrap on here just to hold it all together. But it's a very simple, basic uh, generator, something that anybody could put together, even us women. And, and if this is a little bit too complicated, I have an even easier way you can make a generator. Uh, I have three batteries, and I just find it's easier. I just rubber band them together. Now, in that picture that I set around, uh, that gentleman, he, he drilled holes in a uh, Altoids box, and the three batteries fit right into there. And that's the other way I was going to show here. Because uh, if, if that's too complicated to, to connect those up in series, you can just take two batteries, and you can connect your batteries up one right after the other in series. So you connect them up like this. And then you just put an alligator clip with a connector on each end. And you're going to end up what, what I did here, and I'm, I'm going to take this apart because if these clips touch each other when I've got it connected together, I'll short out the batteries. But you just take these connectors like this. Okay, you slip that through an alligator clip. Trim, trim off the end of the sheaf here to, to expose the wire. Slip that through into your alligator clip. Fasten the screw down. And then snip the, if, you're, if this is your negative, then just snip the negative wire off and then snap it right onto your battery. So even, even a, an electrical illiterate like me can do that. <laughs> okay. So, and some people will use four batteries, but you know, I, I use three and, and it's no problem. So for kids, I had four batteries connected to it. Oh. Okay, okay, huh. Okay, so when I go to make it, I, I have my silver wires. I, I've taken this, now it's probably already cold by now, but you just take like a, a quart mason jar, works very well, something that can handle the heat. And I heat mine. I know you, you don't heat yours, do you? I heat mine because it speeds up the reaction. So instead of using the salt as a catalyst to speed up the reaction, I use heat as a catalyst to speed up the reaction. And uh, the heat also produces a smaller particle size. So you're going to get a better quality of colloidal silver when you do that. I usually, a, a jar like this, it takes about seven minutes, and I, I heat it right up until the point that it starts to boil, I shut it off. Okay, and then uh, I just attach my wires to the, now I just clip them to the side of the jar like this. Okay, you want to try to have it an equal distance between the two wires. Do not allow the two wires to touch because, again, you'll short circuit your batteries. Now, there's, uh, there's other ways. If you, if you want to make sure that they don't touch, like uh, what Doc has here with the, with the chip clip, that's a great way to keep them from coming into contact with each other. Some people will take a uh, plastic lid on top of the jar. They'll punch a hole, two holes in the top of the lid and use that to keep them separate. Uh, some people will get fancy. They'll take a block of wood and drill holes in it or uh, uh, some styrofoam to, to punch holes through. But uh, 
I don't know, I, I've done it this way, it works fine for me, and the styrofoam I tried, and that kind of got a little messy. <laughs> so I don't really recommend that one. So I attach those, and then the only thing left is I just take my generator. Uh, I always I always start out, it's, it's my old automotive days, I always start out with the positive lead first, and then hook up the alligator clip to the other one for the, for the negative. Okay, so now imagine this is hot, and now I've hooked this up and I need it sit for 10 minutes. Okay, and then at the end of 10 minutes, and we're not gonna do it because of the sake of time, but at the end of 10 minutes then, you're gonna see what, what's gonna happen during that time, and, and more so on the second session, uh, as it starts to, uh, as the silver ions start to slough off into the solution, you're going to see one side is going to start looking black. One of your, that would be your uh, anode, I think, is the one that starts looking black. Uh, that's your positive terminal. Your negative is going to have bubbles that rise up out of it. Now, what those bubbles are is actually uh, hydrogen peroxide. So you're actually creating some hydrogen peroxide in the process. Okay, so I've left this on for 10 minutes. Okay, then all I do is I take this off. And a lot of times I'll just put my clip on the, on the end here just to keep them, keep them from contacting each other. I'll take my wires out, take my scrubby and, and scrub it down, if I can get one out here. But, and for some reason, the green scrubbies are the best. So use the green, and it has just the right amount of roughness. So I scrub that off, put this back in the microwave for one minute just to bring it up to boiling again. Okay, and then we repeat the process. So then I bring it back after I bring it back up to boiling. I put them back in, hook the generator back up, and leave it sit for another 10 minutes. Take a look at it after that, and what you'll see is you're, you're going to start seeing a, a pale yellowish tinge, okay? And, and that's what you want to look for is that pale yellow. It can vary. The amount of time can vary depending on the water you're using, the temperature in the room. Uh, there's a lot of variables, so you, you kind of have to go by uh, what you see happening as far as the reaction, as far as how long this is going to take. Um, I take like a white piece of paper and I, hide, I hold it up behind it and look for that yellow. It'll look very pale yellow, and when you get to that point, when you first start to see that, then you want your reaction to go five more minutes and that'll give you your ideal amount uh, as far as the parts per million that you're going to have. What's so, the ideal for parts per million? Uh, well, I mean, it will vary. I mean, most of the time when you make it like this, you're going to have somewhere between five and ten parts per million. Uh, as far as a home-style generator, the best you can possibly do is 20 parts per million. If you start going up above that, your particle size is going to be so big that it's going to start falling out of solution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Clear, and it's 450 parts per million. Uh huh. Yeah, and that's because you've got a very small particle size there. Yeah. Where did you make that? I made the same thing you do. The exact same thing. The the one thing that I. Spring water. But it's mm -hmm. got to be real spring water. It's got this stuff that says spring. And, and I boil it. Just everything she's doing is what mm -hmm. I do. One thing I will warn you about, though, on uh, uh, you're using a, you're testing for total dissolved solids. Uh, the one thing that I'm going to warn you about on that is there's a difference between particle size and parts per million. And really, for it to be a, a therapeutic value, the, parts, the particle size is the most important. It's more important than parts per million. And that's another thing that the manufacturers try to get you on. They try to hit you with this high number of parts per million 
what, when what really counts is that small particle size. The, it needs to be small enough to enter a single-celled organism. So you, you need to think it, of it as having to be extremely small to be effective. If it's too big, what's going to happen is if you leave it sit, you're going to see a lot of particles settling out in the bottom of your jar that will be falling out of solution later on. So, and, and with the manufactured uh, colloidal silver, one of the ways they get it to have that high parts per million is they add protein to the mix. And, and the, they get a higher parts per million, but the, the silver has attached to protein ions, and so you have less surface area for that silver to actually react and work in the body. So you're always better off to make your own fresh colloidal silver. Uh, that way you know it's not contaminated. And usually if your colloidal silver is contaminated and, and you purchase it, it's probably because it has the protein in it. Uh, a lot of the purchased colloidal silver uh, has uh, chemicals in it. Because theoretically, this won't go bad. You could put it on a shelf for a thousand years, right? And it would still be? It can oxidize. Okay. So, uh, you know, think rust. Silver, silver, your rust is black or gray. So if, if, you, if you open up your bottle of colloidal silver and it looks black or gray, it's no good. It will not, it will not achieve what you want it to do. So if you really want good colloidal silver, it's going to be uh, clear or pale yellow is your, is your best. Uh, some people like to go for that golden yellow or that amber color, but I, I don't find that that's any more effective than, than the pale yellow. What's the safe dosage? Okay. Uh, now, I, I handed out a sheet uh, with dosage levels, uh, uh, and what that is is that's a little chart that gives you a good nutritional value dosage. People take colloidal silver in two different ways. They can take it as a regular nutritional supplement uh, that they take it on a daily basis. And that's what this chart shows you is what is a safe amount. It's like 20% below the, the uh, uh, highest levels that the government allows. And if you... Uh, a good rule of thumb is two teaspoons a day would be a, a, a fairly safe uh, rule of thumb for a nutritional. I take mine and, huh? <laughs> you take it without food, take it in between meals. Mm -hmm. And I take mine, uh, now here's some that I already have made. But I will take, huh? Uh, I, I would not. I would not because you still might have some compounds in there. Is that a glass bottle or plastic? This is a plastic model. And there's been a lot of controversy. Do you have glass? Do you have plastic? Technically, the, the glass has no greater advantage than a plastic when it comes to silver. What will make a difference is silver uh, is photosensitive, and so it will oxidize when exposed to the light. So, so you don't want to have it exposed to the light. So I find, I find these bottles like this are perfect. Uh, if you don't have a brown bottle or a cobalt bottle, I've taken quart jars and wrapped them in tin foil. You know, and stick them in a, in a cupboard somewhere where it's not exposed. But I usually take about two ounces of colloidal silver, and then I add about six ounces of water. Yeah, this works great externally. As a matter of fact, I use it externally more than I use it internally. Uh, cuts, uh, especially anything gets infected. I mean, it clears up infections really, really, really fast. Um, uh huh. Um, but anyway, you, but you don't, before I got the, the gel, I just used the liquid. You can use the liquid externally, uh, too. The liquid just doesn't stay on as easily. I mean, you put a band on a bandage or something like that. Uh, the gel is just a little bit more convenient to apply, um, and it's more convenient to apply.
for like diaper, diaper rash and stuff. I'm not kidding. It's a miracle. You know someone who has a, a child who uh, has diaper rash every now and then, you know, get them some of that. I mean, it clears it up instantly. Okay. Um, I really appreciate uh, Teresa being here. Wasn't she great? Let's give her one more hand. Uh, this, as part of our Civilization Preservation Program, this is something that you can use if you, are can't, if you can't get to a doctor or you can't get uh, prescription uh, antibiotics. Um, this is an alternative that, that you can take something you can make at home. Um, and, and that's the reason that we presented this as part of our Civilization Preservation Program.